Productive gardening isn't just about cramming in as many vegetables as you can. If you're not including insect attracting flowers, you're missing out on one of the most important elements of any garden, those pollinating insects and other beneficial bugs. Hi, I'm Ben, and in this video, we're going to sow some flowers to feed the soul and boost your garden more than you can imagine. You want bigger, stronger crops, right? Well, let me show you how. Flowers among your crops turn what might otherwise be a purely utilitarian space into a place of intense beauty. It's remarkable what a splash of colour can do to spruce things up and lift the whole feel of a place. But it's more than that. You've heard of flower power, right? Well, it's true. Flowers really can up your game, boosting crop growth by fueling the bug life that helps plants grow to their full potential. So I'm delighted that today we're going to start off some flowers right behind me in the vegetable garden, ready for this growing season. I'm going to start with tough, resilient flowers that with any luck will pop up time and again, year after year. They're what's called self-seeders, which means that the seeds that they drop will survive the winter and come up next spring. So with any luck, we'll get flowers for many years to come. Now, the best plants for that purpose are hardy annuals. That's flowers that grow, flower and set seed all within one year. I've three flowers in mind that are perfect for growing in the vegetable garden. That's because they not only attract pollinators like bees, but also pest predators like hoverflies, lacewings and ladybugs or ladybirds. And what are they? Well, number one is calendula with its beautiful, sunny, cheering flowers. Calendula, also known as pot marigold, thrives in pretty much any garden soil, including porous soils. It loves the sunshine, but does okay in light shade too. What an accommodating flower. You can eat the petals, they look fab in salads and soups, and it's a great companion plant because studies have shown it helps repel pests like aphids, brassica-eating caterpillars, and armyworms. Calendula is generally best sown where it's going to grow. I've prepared this soil already by lightly forking it over to fluff it up a bit. And just to be on the safe side and to help open it up just a touch more, I'm going to add some compost and fork that in as well. So these seeds are pretty small, so they don't need to go very deep, maybe a quarter to half an inch or just under a centimetre, say, deep. I'm just literally pushing them in here and there. In fact, it's probably easier just to scatter them a bit like that. And then I'll just poke them in where I see them. I'll thin them once they've germinated. Now I'm pushing it a little bit here. It's perhaps just a touch too early to sow, but I'm desperately impatient. So I'm making sowings of calendula into plug trays as well. They're going in at the same depth and they can be planted out once they fill their plugs without disturbing the roots. They'll just slip out quite easily, I think. Now, I've got a little story to tell you. When I was younger, I used to work in a nursery growing plants, perennial plants, for garden designers. And many of these garden designers exhibited at the big flower shows, like the Chelsea Flower Show. Now, one year, they, uh, one of the designers they were growing plants for needed some calendulas, and the nursery didn't have any. So I was asked, did I have some? And you know what? I did. So I dug it up, potted it up and took it in and it featured in that show garden. And you know what? That garden won a gold. So I like to think I perhaps had my part to play. Next up is, drum roll please, nasturtiums. And I've got two of these stunners to sow, a beautiful variegated variety and one that's uh, great for climbing up things like trellis. So these are going to be dotted around. So. Uh, something to tell you about nasturtiums, they're an absolute boon for the bees, let me tell you. But as you'll have discovered in my recent companion planting video, linked to that below, they're great at luring away brassica hungry caterpillars. So that will help protect things like kale and broccoli, for example. Oh, and every single part of the nasturtium is edible, from the leaves to the beautiful flowers to the super spicy seed pods. So I'm going to sow them in exactly the same way as I did the calendula into these plug trays of uh, just an all-purpose potting mix. They're nice big chunky seeds so yeah they're about the size of a pea so there's um, no missing them. I'm going to do two to a, uh, a plug and then they can sort of go out as a pair hopefully. I found that nasturtiums are absolutely 
loved by mice. So my advice would be just to secure them uh, from mice. So um, put them in a box or something until they've come up. I will hold off making direct sowings of nasturtium outside until a little bit later on in spring. Nasturtiums are hardy, but they're a little bit delicate earlier on in their life. Now to our third and final hardy annual we'll be sowing today, and that's the poached eggplant, also known as Limnanthes. And when you look at the flowers, you can really see how they get their name. What absolute stunners. Again, the poached eggplant is loved by pollinators, as well as attracting the likes of aphid-hungry hoverflies. It grows in sun or part shade and prefers a free-draining soil. I'm sowing these guys outside again where they're going to grow. The seeds are quite tiny, so I'm just gonna sort of tickle them in. That should do it. And then once they're up, I'll thin them out to about um, four inches or 10 centimeters apart to give them enough room to grow. As well as sowing them direct, I'm gonna start off a separate batch in plugs in the greenhouse to grow on and plant later on in spring. I'll plant them willy-nilly here and there because they're such a well-behaved diminutive plant and they'll add splashes of cheer everywhere. One thing interesting about poached egg plants actually is they can be treated like a cover crop or green manure. So you dig them in just before they set seed. So you get a lovely splash of colour and then you can turn them in ready to plant your autumn crops. Of course, it's worth sowing half hardy or frost tender annuals as well. And I've got three of these to sow too. First up is Alisum, and this is another great one for attracting those hoverflies. It's a small, almost ground-hugging annual, which makes it a super choice for not only slotting in here and there, right in among aphid-vulnerable crops such as lettuce, but also to use as an edging around beds. Then next up is this marigold. Marigolds are a great companion plant, especially for tomatoes, as their scent helps to deter whitefly. So I'll be growing them in among my tomatoes, along with basil, to deter other pests. Then finally, the zinnia. Zinnia grows a little bit taller at around two foot or 60 centimetres or more, so it'll add a little bit of welcome height to the garden. Zinnia is great at attracting butterflies, including monarch butterflies and painted ladies, so this will add colour in more ways than one. Grow it in a sunny spot, it's good for both the flowers and of course the butterflies that come to sip the nectar. As they do grow a bit taller, I'll expect to be staking these as they grow. It's amazing the difference an hour can make. It was absolutely tipping it down just now, and now it's gloriously sunny, but I guess that's spring for you. So I'm going to start all of these half-hardy annuals off in the same way, in their own uh, seed flats or trays, or in my case, little pots of pre-wetted seed starting mix, and that will give them a really good start. I'm just gonna space the seeds out individually over the surface so the seedlings have enough room to get started and then once I've sown them I'm going to just cover them over ever so slightly just so the seeds go out of view and for that I can use more of the same seed starting mix or I'm going to use some vermiculite just enough to get the seeds out of uh, view. There we are and then I'll just give it a quick spray to moisten the surface as well. Now, we've got to protect these half hardy annuals to help them um, germinate. They like it nice and warm. So I'm just securing a bit of clear polythene over the pots like this. And then they're gonna go onto a tray. And then they've got this humidity dome to go over the top to keep them extra snug. I'm going to pop these indoors on a warm windowsill just above a heat source so they get a bit of bottom heat and they'll germinate really quickly. This lot here germinated in about, honestly, about five days so they come up really quickly. Ideally they want to be at around 23 Celsius say or 75 Fahrenheit for the absolute optimal germination speed so a propagator is ideal but these weren't in a propagator and it got quite cool at night and they still did fine so maybe not that essential. Uh, here they are grown on a few weeks later these lots have been transplanted or pricked out into their plug trays those are marigold seedlings and then I've got these alisum here to do so let's just uh, prick these out now. As always when 
pricking out or transplanting anything, handle by the leaves and not delicate stems. And uh, don't be afraid to set them a little bit lower than they were to help support the stems if they're slightly long and lanky. Now all of these half hardy annuals will be grown on uh, somewhere protected, in my case in this greenhouse it's warm and um, there's no danger of frost in here. And then as we near our last frost date I'll start hardening them off or acclimatising them to outdoor conditions and all that means is just leaving them out for progressively longer. So at first they'll be out for maybe one or two hours during the day in a shelter position and then by the end of say 10 days to uh, two weeks they'll be out for all day long and only brought in if it's uh, going to be a little bit on the chilly side. Uh, so that's the best way to get them ready for the great outdoors. Don't forget that many common herbs are fantastic, and I mean really fantastic sources of both nectar and pollen for all sorts of beneficial bugs. High up on the list are basil and parsley, which I had growing here in amongst the beans last year, and this is some of them still hanging on this year. They were fantastic and the beans were trouble free. Coincidence? Maybe, but I'll be doing the same again this year. Many of these herbs I can buy as living herbs from the grocery store or supermarket very cheaply indeed. These can then be split up and repotted to grow on a bit before planting them out into their final positions a few weeks later. There's one herb you don't see for sale very often and that's dill, so I've got myself a packet of seeds here. I'll sow it in another couple of weeks once it's warmed up a bit. I'll scatter the seeds, rake them in so the seeds are in good contact with the soil and then water thoroughly to set them on their way. Dill flowers are almost identical to fennel flowers which are a taller perennial herb. So if you fancy that, and trust me it's an absolute beauty, consider planting it for many years of insect attracting blooms. And there are of course many insect friendly flowering perennial herbs you can include, such as chives, rosemary and sage. And here all the flowers are dropped into my garden plan and it's looking so colourful already. What an absolutely stunning way to boost crop growth. Now what vegetable garden friendly flowers are you hoping to plant this season? Let me know in the comments below. In our next episode we'll be looking at one of the most nutritious vegetables you could possibly grow. What is it? Well I'm afraid I'm going to keep you guessing for now. You'll have to tune in next week or better still subscribe and turn on notifications so you're always kept in the loop. I will catch you next time.